are delighted to welcome you here to the uh, fourth and final session of our No Way to Treat a Child series. Uh, today's session will be looking at the role of technology and how we can use technology, uh, big data, and data gathering to better understand the risks of child maltreatment. This again is the fourth of a four-part webinar series uh, based on the very important book written by our uh, host, Naomi Schaefer Riley. Um, this all began with uh, her talk here on campus earlier this year and uh, the importance of exploring public policy for the least of these is certainly a major theme here for the Graduate School of Public Policy. Uh, before I turn it over to Naomi, who will introduce, uh, introduce our guest, I just uh, again want to let you know that as the fourth in this series, uh, all of the videos from the preceding three webinars are available on our website, and we'll have uh, Melissa put up the link to that website. If you missed one of the earlier seminars, uh, please feel free to view them at your leisure uh, through the link that will be provided. The usual uh, agenda that we have set for these hour-long uh, hour sessions that we have together is that we will begin uh, with a conversation between Naomi and uh, our guest today, and uh, then open it up for your questions. So please have those questions ready. Feel free to enter those at any time in the chat feature that you'll find at the bottom of the screen, uh, but please know that we'll be getting to those in turn. Again, it's been a great pleasure to work with uh, Naomi over the course of this semester on this four-part webinar series that's been so well received and obviously important, not only uh, for a national policy discussion, but particularly here in Southern California, and even more specifically here in Los Angeles County, uh, where our, I know our guest today has done some research work as well. So perhaps we'll we'll get a chance. I know we'll have some folks from LA County joining this call as well. And so without any further ado, Naomi, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Dean Peterson, and thanks for hosting another one of these. Um, I do hope that if you haven't had a chance to watch the previous three. We've had some terrific guests um, who can really illuminate a lot of the different issues surrounding child welfare. So again, I'm Naomi Riley, and my guest today um, is Emily Putnam Hornstein. Um, she is a professor at UNC, but she actually uh, was for a long time uh, based in California. Um, she still holds a distinguished professorship uh, at the University of Southern California, um, and she has been very involved in helping LA County figure out uh, which children are most at risk for abuse and neglect um, and how we can reach those children and help them uh, in a timely manner. So welcome, Emily. Thanks so much for joining us today. Terrific. Thank you so much, Naomi. Really appreciate the opportunity. So I just wanted to start um, by asking a little bit about your background, kind of how you got into this work. Um, you know, it's sort of, sort of the intersection of data and social work are not kind of things that we normally think of as going together. And I know, you know, we, we get a lot of people who are, um, you know, who are interested in thinking about their futures in public policy. And if you can just kind of describe a little bit about how you got into it in this particular way, um, and then we can kind of talk later on about, you know, sort of what directions public Public policy could take that would involve these different areas? Sure, absolutely. Um, so I have always had an interest in children and families, ended up in a job after college where I was actually working as a caseworker in New York City with adolescents who were placed in a group home. Um, tremendous learning experience, spent a lot of time in the family court system, a lot of time um, working with families, working with the youth. Uh, but I think had the, the, the realization at, at some point, maybe a year or two in, that a lot of the, uh, the challenges that I was facing as a caseworker and that my families and children were facing in navigating the bureaucracies um, were a byproduct 
of some of the, the systems that were operating around them. So became increasingly interested in that kind of public policy angle. Um, ended up going back and getting my master's degree in social work because I knew I wanted to remain connected to the field um, of child welfare, um, but then jumped into a PhD program where I had an opportunity to really think about that system through the, the lens of, of data. Um, and so I, I would not claim to have um, much in terms of clinical experience but I would say that it was that initial clinical experience that really led me down this path. So tell us, I mean, we hear a lot about kind of the usefulness of big data and algorithms um, in all sorts of fields of sports and business um, and social media. And can you explain why you think it's useful to think about big data and algorithms in approaching the problems of our child welfare system. What is it that sort of it, it invited um, kind of this kind of inquiry for you? Sure. Um, before we even get to, to big data and algorithms in child welfare, I think that what, what people on this webinar need to appreciate is that many of our public agencies are forced to operate with data systems and technologies that are literally decades old. Um, so one of the real challenges that I think we face, uh, in, that the child protection workers face generally, is they are working with kind of this dated technology where, you know, 20 years ago when these systems were designed, they were really designed to take data in, but at that time, we didn't have great ways of delivering that data back out from a visual standpoint or a use standpoint. So as a researcher, um, I tended to see the, the back end of those data systems, uh, lots of information, but more recently, I've become very interested in how we can not just use that data for, for research and to guide policy, which is great, but how we can also start to uh, deliver it to caseworkers and supervisors who are forced to make kind of really important decisions in real time in a way that is much more useful to them. And so that's where this kind of, you know, big data and algorithms has emerged uh, in child welfare. In my mind, it's really just about helping the workforce use the data that they're already being asked to incorporate into their decision making. Um, but uh, I think some others uh, view it a little bit more skeptically, so. Oh, Naomi, you're on mute. One way just to help people understand maybe, um, maybe we could just focus in on LA for a minute, um, kind of the scope of the problem. I mean, in terms of just how many calls are coming in, uh, reporting, for instance, child abuse and neglect um, on a daily, weekly, monthly, and yearly basis, um, and just asking kind of workers, hotline operators, supervisors, caseworkers to sort through that information in some kind of organized fashion. Um, what do you think is the potential for you know, getting updated data systems and using more kind of modern technology and analysis in order to, to understand those problems? What, how would you describe kind of the scope of the situation and the ways that the data analysis you're doing might help us sift through it better? Yeah, perfect. I think what I'll do, even though we have folks on from LA, I'm just gonna present some numbers for California overall. Um, so, in California, we have about half a million unique children <laughs> who are reported for alleged abuse or neglect uh, every single year. What happens is workers in each of the counties will receive those calls and they will need to make a decision as to whether under state statute what is being communicated warrants an in-person investigation. So it's not that we automatically go out to talk to all families when there's been a call of alleged abuse or neglect. Now, um, all of those workers are actually using a case management system that was implemented in 1998 
Um, so quite dated in terms of that information. It's incredibly rich in that it means that we have 20 plus years of data, um, but quite dated in terms of the technology. And what those workers are asked to do is to assess the information that's coming in from a reporter. It might be a doctor, it could be a community member, it could be a family member and assess the quality of that information and the severity of the claims, but they're also asked to position that new call in the context of history that we may have with that family concerning either these children or other children. And I think that's, um, Naomi, where the real challenge lies. Often, if we receive a call from a doctor in a hospital and you have a child with a suspicious fracture, um, I think 99% of us would say, okay, that would warrant an investigation. We're going to go check on that child and see if there are child protection concerns. But we're not asking our systems to simply respond to immediate safety concerns. We're also asking them to assess the risk of future harm. And that's where whether we like it or not, the best predictor of what's going to happen in the future is what's happened in the past, but we are not currently doing a very good job of assembling information so that workers can consistently use and incorporate that historical information into their assessments of future risk of harm, um, as well as what services might be needed to hopefully prevent that harm from occurring. So um, one of the things that um, I know you've worked on is this pilot program in, in Allegheny County, which is the area around Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and that's where you've done the most extensive amount of this work. Can you kind of describe what was what were the circumstances on the ground that um, made that a kind of fertile community for you to work in and what a community would have to do in order to um, implement these kind of programs. I mean, you talked about kind of outdated data systems. Um, you know, there is a lot of data, obviously, that we're collecting on these families, but it's going to all different places. I mean, we have, um, you know, education departments and criminal justice organizations, and we have um, informations about, about TANF and, and other services that families might be receiving, but they're all kind of going to their separate agencies. So can you talk a little bit about kind of what, what would have to happen for those agencies to be able to interact with each other um, and how you created um, kind of the this initial pilot program um, in Allegheny County. Sure, so um, in Allegheny County, uh, what my colleague Rima Vaithianathan and I were able to do was to partner with their agency to implement an algorithm or a predictive risk model at the time that calls came into the hotline. Um, but I want to step back just a bit because Naomi, you asked me to kind of respond to what, what would be required, why was this fertile ground? And I think that there were, um, I guess, at least two really, really important kind of contextual pieces to the work we were able to do. One was undoubtedly the leadership um, so I think that the leadership had a very um, uh, kind of trusted relationship with the community. There had been, um, you know, decades long efforts to really engage in conversations around the child welfare system, as well as other public systems. Um, and so when the leadership came forward and said, here's something that we want to try, um, we're not sure if it'll work, it's new. And we're going to bring you to the table at every stage to understand what we're doing and why we're doing. I think that they were given a bit more of a runway than perhaps some other child welfare leaders may have been given. Um, the second piece was that they had a data warehouse. Um, uh, those of us who work with data from public systems will sometimes describe Allegheny as the unicorn in the field because um, they, again, um, as a function of their, their leadership, have um, invested heavily for decades in pulling together all of their human services data. Um, so what tends to happen is the system that you interact with will hold 
your records for that system, whether it's receiving public benefits or being reported to the child protection system, even though often these systems are all operating under a unified human services or health and human services umbrella. And so what Allegheny had done years ago was to say, the best way for us to deliver responsive services to our community is to make sure that we're pulling all of that data together so we understand who we're serving, um, how those services are working, what outcomes we're producing. So they already had this very kind of rich data warehouse where what they were asking their child protection workforce to do was when new calls were coming into the hotline, they were asked to not just look at historical child protection information, but to understand the family in the context of all of their interactions with the county. But what they realized um, is that they hadn't necessarily given their workforce the tools needed to use all that data. Um, it really is, again, there's only so much information you can kind of hold and wait in your mind. And so that's where they put out a call to explore whether there would be ways that they could uh, adopt a an algorithm that would more systematically pull forth all that information and deliver it to their workers as part of their decision making process, rather than just relying on individual workers to look it up and decide how much do I as a worker weight the fact that the police were out uh, due to a 911 call a week ago versus my colleague who might place a very different emphasis on that recent piece of history as an important contextual marker. So, I mean, the way you're describing it, obviously, I mean, we are asking child welfare workers to do an enormous amount and, and there's a very high turnover in the workforce, um, some places as high as even 40%. Um, you know, there's definitely issues about compensation and training, but but just the amount of um, of information that we're asking them to absorb and make decisions about in a very high pressure environment. As you say, these are kind of very high stakes decisions that they have to make. Um, so when when you were presenting um, this model, um, how was it received uh, at the agency there? And and generally speaking, do you think that workers have found this to be a helpful tool for them? Um, so I think there's the question uh, as to how is it received by the internal staff and the workforce, and then how was it received by the community at large, which was brought to the table to, to have discussions. Um, so the, the first thing I, I just want to clarify before I go further is that um, the use case for this model that was initially piloted in Allegheny County um, really importantly was not being used to make a decision uh, right. as to whether they were going to investigate for abuse or neglect or not. Um, it was simply one additional piece of information that workers and supervisors were given as part of their decision-making process as to whether they were going to go out and investigate or not. So um, I bring that up because that really, I think, impacted conversations with both of those groups I, I mentioned. Um, obviously, as human beings, um, we will often trust our decisions more than decisions that are made for us. And so it was really important that that was communicated that this was another tool in their toolbox, but that workers still had um, the ability to screen things out that the model may have thought were high risk and to screen things in that the model may have thought were low risk. So that was really important. Um, practice change is always tricky. I am now um, a, a much more, a much stronger believer in um, the, the importance of ongoing efforts to really ensure good implementation and training. Um, but I, I think that if you went back and spoke to, to kind of workers in Allegheny today, what you would hear is um, generally a, a pretty positive response to it. I do remember one meeting we had with workers um, a few months after it had initially been implemented, and it really stuck with me because um, what the workers said is, 
listen, I'm not sure uh, I really understand exactly how this model is working. Um, but what I know is that because when I go into my kind of supervisor's office with a recommendation as to whether we're going to investigate or not, my supervisor is going to ask me about what this tool indicated. It's forcing me to do a slightly more intentional and deeper dive into the data. And that's leading to richer conversations with my supervisor about, again, services or risk. And, and I think that that's, that's what you want to hear. So that was, that was really terrific. Um, as to kind of how the community felt, I think that with all things big data and algorithms, the, the kind of the key is how they are being used and how they're being implemented. And so again, it was really, really important to be able to communicate that this was not driving any decisions, um, but that it was going to be used as, as a part of the decision-making process and that the county was very, very committed to sharing information on an ongoing basis, which I think is uh, something that they, they have very much fulfilled. Mm -hmm. So um, in terms of the, I know it was, it was sort of used in this um, kind of hotline level, um, but you know, there's a big emphasis right now in, uh, in the field of child welfare on going upstream and thinking about preventive services. Can you talk a little bit about the Hello Baby program and, and how we're thinking about using data in order to help people before they get caught up in the child welfare system? Yeah, so um, uh, happy to happy to chat about that. Um, so one of the challenges we have in child protection is we're only able to respond when a call comes into the child abuse and neglect hotline. Um, child welfare is really not situated to be a uh, kind of a prevention agency or certainly not a primary prevention agency. And um, and yet all of us who work in child welfare always wish that we could be more intentional in those primary prevention efforts. And so what Allegheny did is they said, okay, we're using data, we're using this algorithm to hopefully make better decisions when calls come into the hotline so that we can think about secondary and tertiary prevention efforts as needed through that system. But are there opportunities to move even further upstream? And that's where the Hello Baby program came in that they have launched and is, um, is, is very much still a, a, a kind of a learning, um, a learning pilot. But what the Hello Baby program is, is it's, um, it's looking at all newborns who are born in the county and um, in the context of Hello Baby, which is considered a universal program, it's figuring out how do we use data to offer families different tiers of support that align with their needs. And rather than just relying on a clinician to refer a family as perhaps needing um, home visiting services, for example, what they're doing is they are using data to say, these are the families um, where we think that the, the need is greatest and we're going to prioritize them for all of our, every service we have in county in the county. Um, they're then using the model to identify a slightly lower um, need group of families and they get kind of in a different array of offerings. And then everyone else in the county can avail themselves of universal offerings under Hello Baby. And so the idea is really how do we use data to, <laughs> to kind of match the needs of families to the existing services that we offer in the fam. I'm sorry, in the county. Um, so can you share with us um, any of the results that you've seen either from the use of the algorithms in the hotline context or in the use in the Hello Baby context that you think suggests that this is something that more counties and more communities should consider using? Yeah, so um, I'll start with the, the hotline context, um, using data to improve screening decisions. 
Um, so whenever we are developing and implementing these algorithms or models, the way that they're developed is by using historical data and looking at the decisions that human beings were making relative to what decisions or what kind of pathways a model would have suggested. And so certainly in the context of Allegheny County's hotline screening tool, um, the very basis for moving forward was very, very compelling data that suggested that many of the families who were being reported for abuse and neglect and were being screened out without any kind of um, assessment or investigation were being re-reported multiple times in the years to come. And sometimes children were being detained following one or more of those future reports. And so we had very good data that perhaps we were missing opportunities to connect families to services earlier um, in the hopes of preventing those future calls and future foster care placements. Um, in, in the context of, of Hello Baby, it was a very similar thing uh, in the sense that we could use historical data. And what we could see is that in many of the um, the programs that the county was administering, uh, we were not seeing the families with the greatest need or the greatest risk profile. We were seeing kind of families who were more in the middle of the distribution. And it was fine that they were receiving services, but in many cases, the services we're offering are really intended to be uh, adopted by kind of high risk families. And that's not what we were seeing. So you can almost describe it as kind of a mismatch. And that's what in both cases we were trying to attend to um, with the use of, of data um, plus uh, plus human. Um, so obviously you've, you've faced a lot of pushback in your work, um, but the sort of hottest area, I think, of uh, concern among communities that have adopted this or are considering adopting some of this um, is the question of uh, how it might disproportionately impact people of one race versus another. Um, so, you know, there is a lot of conversation now about uh, whether the use of data in this way, the use of big data, the use of algorithms um, has the potential for perpetuating racial bias in our systems. Um, you know, if you already see certain uh, certain patterns, uh, is big data kind of dooming us to repeat those and and make certain um, aspects of our system that that might be biased even worse? Um, so I wanted to ask you sort of first in the context of Allegheny County, what you found um, in terms of Black children um, being reported, um, their cases being substantiated, and uh, and them ultimately being removed to foster care, whether you, you found that the use of algorithms had any impact on the way Black children were being treated in the system, and then just sort of generally kind of, you know, looking at this from a more 30,000 foot level, um, what you think, uh, you know, in terms of the, of the use of data in terms of either remedying some racial bias or or is it does it have the potential to sort of perpetuate racial bias in our systems yeah so um certainly one of the the biggest kind of critiques and concerns that we have heard is um if we have uh kind of junk data going in or biased reports coming into the system and, and we've, as a system, responded in a, um, a biased or an unfair fashion with regards to certain groups, then when you take all this historical data and you model that, you are really just baking all of that into any algorithm that, that you would deploy. Um, and I wish I had a, a, a perfect, simple, reassuring response to that, but the reality is that um, I have no doubt that there is bias that is in the data we're looking at, but there's also, in my mind, incredible bias, but also just noise and inconsistency in our human decision makers. 
And so in my mind, um, you know, I, I, I don't think that these algorithms are perfect or a magic bullet, but we as a field of child welfare have had um, pervasive and entrenched racial disparities that have emerged in our system for as long as I've been doing this work. And I have yet to see anything that has truly moved the needle on that. And so I certainly don't think that we should be throwing algorithms out simply out of a fear that things could get worse because we can just keep doing exactly what we're doing with the tools we have and the workforce we have, and we will get the exact same thing that we have um, we have today. Now, one thing that um, I think is really important for the audience to, to understand is that um, the great thing about these algorithms and these models is that um, you can very clearly look at how they are performing for different groups. Whereas I can't take a peek inside the head of one caseworker versus another to understand what kind of internal algorithm they were using that may have led to an African-American children being being investigated and a white child not. <laughs> um, so I do think that even if one is hesitant as to um, the, the potential harmful effects of these, uh, in my mind, that's largely an empirical question that can be looked and examined. And so in all of the jurisdictions where we've worked, um, we've, we've kind of approached the question of, of racial disparities in a few different ways. Um, one is that we always look at how the model performs for different racial ethnic groups. Um, and so what I mean by that is when we're using that historical information to um, figure out who the model would recommend for different services or potentially would identify as a family at greater risk of future system involvement, um, we can then look at whether or not that outcome occurred. And so we have an opportunity to say, how does how often does the model get it right or wrong when applied to black children, when applied to white children, when applied to Hispanic children? And so that's one check we make. The other thing we do is we do a lot of work to, to both look at the information that the model is pulling into its kind of process um, and trying to vet that with the community a bit. So um, in all of our juris in all the jurisdictions we've worked with, we have released a full list of all the features and the data elements that are going into the model so that if members of the community said that, that right there, I am really concerned that that is going to have a, a racialized dimension to it and is going to um, affect the performance of the model in a way that I'm not comfortable with, even if we don't see that in the data, we've tried to incorporate that feedback. Um, and so just as, as, um, as an example, in Allegheny, I mentioned they've got this huge data warehouse and that's, um, that's kind of being used by the algorithm. The model that we have launched in Los Angeles County, which is a different use case, um, when we spoke with the community, when we spoke with the state, it was very clear that there was some discomfort with other kind of public service information being pulled in. So we said, okay, we're only going to look at the child welfare fields that workers are already looking at. And here's the list. Let us know if you have concerns about any of those. Um, the final thing I just want to mention, I know, I'm sorry, this is kind of a long-winded answer, but I, I know it's an important question, um, is that we've also done something where we call it um, kind of an external validation or an outside of system um, validation. And so one of the concerns we hear is, well, Emily, you're training these models or RIMA, you're training these models to look at which children are going to be re-reported and placed in foster care within the next two years. And that has been the outcome that we've used in, in all jurisdictions where we've implemented these models. And what if the system has been systematically placing the wrong children in foster care? What if we, what if that's where bias is operating? And um, one way that we have tried to look at that is by thinking about 
outcomes outside of child welfare that we're not training the model um, to predict, but seem like very clear and more objective indicators of, of child safety concerns. And so um, we've looked at hospitalization data, we've looked at child death data, and we've said the models predicting who ends up in foster care, the kids, the model is identifying as these families seem to have higher needs. Um, are we also finding distinct patterns of homicides and fatalities and maltreatment injuries? And the answer is absolutely yes. And so what that tells us is that by wrapping those families in services, by attending to the needs of those families, we may not prevent all of those tragedies from occurring, but we have evidence that we are probably targeting the right group because we're seeing it in this data that's from completely outside of the system. The final thing you said, what happened with race in Allegheny as a result of implementing this model? Um, and the findings, um, a paper is still under peer review. It was led by a fabulous doctoral student. We worked with Catherine Rittenhouse. Um, but what we are finding is um, a, a, a reduction in, in racial disparities as a result of using um, the model. Um, it is modest, but it is real. And, um, and I think that that really speaks to just taking out of the system a little bit of the, the noise and the individual bias that, that probably does operate when we mistake um, uh, race for, for risk, uh, as opposed to really just focusing on risk. Mm. Okay, um, so we are, I'm going to probably ask Emily one or two more questions, and then we're going to open it up to questions from the audience here. So feel free to put your questions into the chat, um, and we will take them up. So the last question I wanted to ask you is just with a view to folks who are interested in forming public policies around child welfare, um, you know, what do you think is the potential here? If you were going to prioritize certain kinds of public policies, um, is it that we need to be allocating more funding for using big data? Um, are there pieces of legislation that need to happen? Um, things that need to change in our legal environment in order for us to make better use of the technology and the data that's out there in order to understand um, which kids are most at risk and how we can best help them? I know this that's is good. slightly- That's a good question. <laughs> Just so the audience knows, I had no idea what questions Naomi was going to ask me. So that one, I wish I had a little more time to think about. Um, but um, but I, I guess I have a, a few thoughts. Um, one is that um, it's interesting to me that people have been um, so concerned about the, the use of, of these new models or algorithms but have not bothered to look closely at all of the other tools that are being used by, by the workforce um, at various stages of decision-making. Because um, again, as Naomi said, these are high stakes decisions and we want them to be fair and we want them to be consistent. We want them to be governed and guided by, by data. And so I do think that um, that there's a real need to look closely at, at some of the tools that are out there that in my mind are very, very dated because I don't want to hear that you don't like an algorithm or predictive risk modeling unless you're comparing it with its alternative and every single jurisdiction is using some kind of um, risk assessment tool. Um, the second thing is that uh, I think the public and legislators and others would be truly shocked if they ever took a peek behind the curtain and looked at the dated case management and technology systems that we are asking our workforce to use. I just don't see how we can hold workers accountable for anything that, that kind of falls through the cracks given the, the kind of the poor resources and tools we're giving them. And you know, I was looking at an article. I mean, it's 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 everywhere. I, I was looking at an article, I think, uh, in North Carolina, where I live, something like $92 million was invested in creating a new case management system for its child welfare workers. And we still don't have one, <laughs> right? Um, you know, and so the, the kind of, I, I think there needs to be 
yeah, more responsibility as to, as to what's happening, uh, what's happening there. So I think Naomi, those would probably be my my two big things where um, there seem to be gross failures and probably not enough policy questioning and attention. Mm, okay. All right. Well, I'm still um, just want to open it up for for questions now from the audience. Please feel free to put your questions in the chat, and we will take them up. Um, just looking at kind of what is the what's going on in LA now. So you're starting this project in LA. Um, can you describe kind of what the uh, what the situation is, where where we are in this process? Um, you know, and and when the community can um, you know hope to understand what the initial results are. I guess. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so we are, I think, at about the the fifteen month mark in terms of um, an initial pilot in Los Angeles County, where the use case was different than than the use case I talked about in Allegheny. Um, in in California, um, we make kind of screening decisions at uh, at the county level, but counties don't have access to all of that information in real time because we have kind of a data system at the state. So in Los Angeles County, what we did is we didn't implement a model to kind of support hotline screening. Instead, what we did is we implemented a model so that after referrals have been screened in for investigation, meaning we're already going to, to kind of go out there. Um, we're using the model to make sure that the supervisor who's overseeing that investigation is alerted if it is a, um, a kind of an investigation where it looks like some more kind of clinical attention and enhanced support may be needed. Um, and so that, that model has been implemented um, in three pilot offices. We've kind of continued to, to track the outcomes <laughs> and the use. And uh, there was an advocates forum at the end of August and um, the Department of Children and Family Services has released a methodology report, some information about the pilot. So I'm happy to, um, to kind of put that in the chat. And so we're kind of learning as we go, but the, um, the initial kind of findings coming out of, of the first year of the pilot are, are really positive in terms of seeing a reduction in re-reporting for families where supervisors were told, hey, um, this is a, a situation where we really want to make sure um, that we're bringing partners to the table early and, um, and connecting this family with services in the community. So can you can you just delve a little bit deeper into that? What does it mean that um, that a supervisor is alerted? What are the circumstances that would merit that? I mean, obviously you have the sort of algorithm producing this um, kind of alert, but what are the factors that would lead you to want a supervisor to look more closely at a situation? Yeah. So, um, so what we what we realized is that when when we have kind of new investigations, the way it generally works is that a, a worker is bringing information to to the supervisors. Um, the supervisors are expected to look at all of the, the history for that family and thinking about assessments and services, but that can be a very time consuming process. And so what we're using the algorithm to do is to pull together information from hundreds of different historical fields um, to basically say, okay, supervisors, if you've got, you've got 10 new investigations today, um, and these are the two where the patterns of history with the department and the fact that a new investigation has been launched would suggest that perhaps in the past, we did not attend to some of the underlying conditions and concerns that continue to give rise to calls from the community with concerns for this child. So as much as you only have so many hours in the day, and um, I was at a meeting recently where someone said, you know, we need to acknowledge that child welfare will always be a resource constrained kind of bureaucracy. Um, it's really saying to those supervisors, hey, sit down and take a careful look at, at these two of the 10, because you're going to want to take advantage of um, uh, of kind of the time that you have before this investigation is closed to really think carefully about how you can better coordinate services for this for this family. So that's 
that's how it's um, that's how it's being kind of piloted and used at this point. Mm -hmm. um, and so the 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 um, you you mentioned that there'll be like a report that the community can see. What is the um, you know, are there mechanisms for once you have the algorithm in place for changing things? And, you know, and how do we, um, how, are there ways to sort of tweak it without sort of taking away its predictive abilities or its useful abilities for supervisors in this case? Yeah, I mean, I think um, it, certainly it's important to keep in mind that, you um, that these, these algorithms should not be implemented and then just left on their <laughs> own. Um, because if the idea is that we're using the algorithm or the data to change practice, um, then we need to continue to, to monitor um, as practice changes, whether the algorithm, how, how it's performing over time. Um, but I think, uh, and Naomi, let me know if this isn't really responsive to your question, but I think the key piece in my mind is that you have this algorithm running and the question is what are the appropriate policies or practices that you attach to that algorithm so i'll give you a very specific example when allegheny first launched their um their algorithm or the allegheny family screening tool they kind of implemented a a kind of a practice where if the algorithm thought that a call was particularly high risk and a, uh, a worker did not think it warranted an investigation, um, there was kind of like a little bit of an additional supervisory sign off to, to kind of not follow up on that. So there was almost kind of this protocol attached to those, those higher risk um, kind of scores. Um, but what they realized is that one of their other goals had also been to not unnecessarily insert uh, government in the lives of families where it's not needed. And so they had hoped to see that more of the, the low risk kind of calls would also be screened out. You know, we don't need to go out there. Maybe we can just connect the family to someone in the community. And they weren't seeing that because practice change is, is slow and hard and we tend to fall back on what we've always done. And so that was a place where they didn't need to kind of change the model. What they needed to do was to reinforce the practice that they wanted to see by adopting a very specific protocol for that model. And so they added what, what's kind of called a low risk protocol, where again, it is an explicit kind of recommendation and process that the default should be that those are screened out, um, but you can still screen it in, but there's a little bit of additional kind of process around departing from um, from that recommended protocol. And so that's an example of how, again, policies and practices can be wrapped around um, these models. And I think that's where the really important kind of community engagement and workforce um, connections need to be made, which is that often as researchers, we're not the ones who are in the best position to say, here's what should be done from a, from a clinical or a practice standpoint. Um, but that's where I think there's a lot of exciting opportunities in the field. Yeah. Do you see potential for, I mean, a, a lot of what we're talking about here is the use of big data in child protection specifically, just sort of a frontline, um, you know, context for it. Do you see other areas where, you know, we could use data to better inform other kinds of child welfare decisions? Um, placement in different kinds of foster homes, uh, you know, how, how good a particular foster family is, um, you know, at, at caring for children, um, or thinking about uh, placements for adoption. Are there, are there other ways that we're just sort of not taking advantage of what so many other sectors are using this data for um, in order to better inform decisions? Um, I think that there are any number of um, decision points where the use of algorithms could be value add. Um, and, you know, I'll give, uh, you know, one example that's been, been brought to me, um, you know, when we, so when we kind of reunify um, children with their families, um, often there are somewhat limited resources as to whether we're offering kind of ongoing wraparound services. 
And so right now in many systems where there are wraparound offerings, it's really just kind of based on whether the worker um, deems that to be a kind of a good resource to offer or not. Um, and I think that creates kind of equity issues in terms of, again, we should be probably offering those wraparound services to the families who need them the most. And so is there an opportunity to use an algorithm? Um, again, not to kind of prescriptively say you must offer X, but to make sure that we're being really smart about how we offer different services and different kind of pathways. Um, you know, you mentioned adoption, and um, I think you and I are both familiar with a colleague who is um, trying to, to kind of use data and an algorithm to do a better job matching children who are already freed for adoption, but waiting in foster care for a family. Um, so I, I do think that there are a number of, of opportunities. I think each use case really needs to be viewed um, as its own use case and assessed through the, the lens of um, what are the potential unintended consequences and what are the opportunities. But I think that I do think that we will see the field increasingly moving in that direction. And I think that what we will find is that as a result, we have um, a better system and a system that is more um, transparent and more accountable to the community for the decisions it, that are being made. And, and interestingly, I mean, and more tailored a little bit to the individual children. I think when people hear about kind of big data and algorithms, they assume that, you know, we're trying to, that, that you know, every child is being, you know, fit into a particular mold and that we're just, you know, offering blanket solutions for everyone. But the potential for the use of the data is really that we will be able to take account of so many more factors in that child's um, context, in their environment, in their family, in their schooling, in all of these things and find solutions that are more likely to fit someone with that particular profile rather than just having a person sit there and sort of say, you know, this seems to me like the most salient thing about this kid and, and kind of just focusing on that and ignoring maybe a lot of other important factors. I, I think that I think that is exactly right. And I also um, suspect that we will see um, a growing uh, kind of evidence base for certain interventions with certain types of children and families who may have specific conditions where we've not historically adopted that lens. And so we, we kind of throw the wrong things at a group of families, and then we don't see the impact or the outcomes we're hoping for. Um, and I think that's often because we have been using a one size fits all as opposed to using data to really think about who needs what. And if we deliver the right thing to the right families, then I think we will see the outcome uh, we're hoping for, and then that will hopefully, from a policy and investment standpoint, provide the, the information that would be needed to invest more heavily in certain um, interventions and preventative services because there's evidence of, uh, of who they work for um, that, again, to use your language, is, is much more tailored and responsive. So just on the investment question, this is my last question for you. I mean, Obviously, there's a you know a large initial investment that is required in order to get all of these data systems on the same page, in order to train workers and that kind of thing. Um, you know what in in terms of sort of going forward, if this if this model were being brought to more communities, um, what kind of investment is required of these communities, and and is it less than kind of when when you're just starting this process initially, like. Can 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 we expect that a few years from now it will be more cost effective for communities to adopt this kind of model? To be honest, I don't think it costs that much. <laughs> I mean, like I, I, if there are any agencies out there, do not let cost be the barrier because the key thing here is that we're we're using data that already exists. So mm -hmm. yes, I'm giving you these examples of oh my gosh, we blew ninety two million dollars on a case management system that's not up and running. But really what we're talking about is um, pulling data from existing systems um, and using kind of a set of features, which based on the work that Rima and I have been doing are fairly common across jurisdictions. So yes, Naomi, I think that the lessons learned from Allegheny and Colorado and Los Angeles 
make it easier for other jurisdictions to learn and move forward. But but none of this work, uh, again, cost is not the, the barrier. I think it's just changing systems and getting people to be open to, to new ways of, of doing things. Yes. Well, that in and of itself is obviously a huge public policy question, <laughs> changing systems. Um, well, thank you so much, Emily, for joining us today. And thank all of you um, for tuning into this. And please look in the chat there for the link to previous uh, webinars that we've had. Um, I really appreciate you joining us today. And um, if you have further questions, please feel free to reach out to me or to Emily. And uh, yeah, thanks again. Thank you.